The Rocky Mount Mills was the second cotton mill built in North Carolina and is located on the Tar River in Rocky Mount. When established in 1818 by Joel Battle and his partners Henry Donaldson and John Hogan, the mill was originally worked by slaves from Joel Battle's plantation. The mills were crucial during all wars, including when it produced textiles for the Confederacy, and later the Allied forces during both world wars. The mills had its shares of ups and downs, and it was burned twice, once during the Civil War as Potter's Raid took place, and the other by a disgruntled employee just a few years later. These burnings would not be the end of the mills, however, as reconstruction was completed and the mill was able to increase their production through technological advances. Sadly, the mill would eventually have to close in 1996 due to competition from foreign labor, which led to an economic slump in the city of Rocky Mount and the loss of jobs for 302 mill workers. Today, the mill is being gentrified by Capital Broadcasting and will once again become a booming attraction in Rocky Mount. The origin of the Rocky Mount Mills began when Joel Battle, Donaldson, and Hogan developed a cotton mill in 1860. Peter Evans was hired as an expert on textiles to teach the employees the process of converting cotton to yarn. The original mill was made of granite and built on 20 acres of land. It expanded in 1819 and became fully operational containing over 2,000 spindles. Joel Battle would eventually buy out his partners, Donaldson and Hogan, purchasing their shares and becoming a sole owner of the mills until his death in 1829. After Battle's death, the mills was owned by the Battleman Brothers, a firm headed by Joel Battle, eldest son, William H. Battle, and James Battle, the Justice of Peace and cousin of William. James S. Battle and his son, William S. Battle, purchased the mill operation in 1847. James was already known throughout the state of North Carolina due to his actions in the state Supreme Court case of State versus Negro Will. A landmark case that demonstrated the battle's progressive views on slavery will be demonstrated in the case of the Negro Will. The slave known as Will and James Battle's slave foreman, Allen, engaged in an altercation over possession of a hoe that Will had made. Will ended up breaking the hoe and went to work in Rocky Mount Mills. The slave overseer, Richard Baxter, was informed of this and took action. He grabbed a loaded gun, jumped on his horse, and ordered Allen, the slave foreman, to follow him with a cowhide whip. Baxter and Allen approached Will. As Will tried to run away, he was shot in the back by Baxter. Will didn't succumb to his wounds and continued to flee, but ended up being intercepted by Baxter. The fight with the two resulted in Will stabbing Baxter in the arm with a knife, causing Baxter to die from loss of blood. Will was then brought to court from this incident. Will was found guilty in Edgecombe County Superior Court of first-degree murder and was to be sentenced to death. However, later investigation by battle convinced him that Will had acted in self-defense under extreme provocation. Battle brought the case to the state Supreme Court, thinking that the ruling of Will being sentenced to death was unjust. Battle paid two leading members of the bar, Bartholomew F. Moore and George Washington Mordecai, $1,000 total to represent Will in court. They brought Will's appeal to the state court, where they were opposed by Attorney General J.R. Daniel. Moore demanded that the law show a humane attitude toward Will, mentioning that Chief Justice Thomas Ruffin's decision in State v. John Mann in 1829 was repugnant and at variance with prior case law. In the previous case, Ruffin wrote, The power of the master must be absolute in order to render the submission of the slave perfect. Although there was much disagreement with Moore at this point, the court had unanimously reversed Will's conviction. The State v. Negro Will court case was contradicted by Justice William Gaston in his quote saying, if the passions of the slave be excited into lawful violence by the inhumanity of a master, is it a conclusion of law that such passion must spring from diabolical malice? This quote was praised by many anti-slavery forces and abolitionists. It was also put in many newspapers and law journals. This case established the following ruling, a general proposition that if a slave in self-defense under strong terror, resentment kills his or her master or overseer, Homicide isn't considered murder, but manslaughter. The original mill was operated by slave labor until 1847, when workers began to be hired as the main labor source and slave labor ended. These workers consisted of white women and children who were paid $2.50 a week. This transition showed the progressiveness of North Carolina compared to other southern slave states prior to the Civil War. When conflict regarding the Civil War broke out, the mills began producing cloth for Confederate uniforms. Due to the mills being the biggest industrial complex in North Carolina and the second largest textile mill in all of the Confederacy, it became the target of Union forces under the command of General Edward E. Potter. 
Potter's raid of Greenville, Tarboro, and Rocky Mountain Mills brought the war to eastern North Carolina. Potter ordered a detachment of New York Cavalry under the command of Ferris Jacobs Jr. to break away the, from the main forces, attack Rocky Mountain Mills, and destroy the mills, the telegraph office, the railroad bridge, and any trains in the depot. The Yankee Cavalry entered Rocky Mountain Mills on January 20th, 1863 in a surprise morning attack. They burned warehouses, supply wagons, the telegraph office, train depot, railroad, and main road bridges. Thousands of bales of cotton and Rocky Mount Mills while also destroying a locomotive, quantities of flour and hardtack. Next on the list of structures to be destroyed was the battle house that served as the superintendent's house. The quick-thinking superintendent told Major Jacobs that the mills did not use slave labor, only white women and children that he himself was from the North and a Freemason. Jacobs, also being a Freemason, spared the battle house. The gang numbered from four to six hundred and came from Washington. At Rocky Mount, they burned the depot, five thousand bales of cotton, a large cotton factory owned by William S. Battle, and captured a train on the Tarboro branch of the Washington Road containing two carloads of ammunition and thirty thousand pounds of bacon, and destroyed the bridge over Tar River, a short distance from Rocky Mount. The track was torn up for a mile or two. The Petersburg Express, July 22, 1863. At the end of the Civil War, William S. Battle rebuilt the mills out of brick. The new mills could produce over 500 pounds of cotton byproduct a day. However, in 1869, the structure was burned down for a second time by a disgruntled employee, and Battle was forced to rebuild another mill made of brick. White farmers and businessmen were forced to deal with the eventual reconstruction policy of the post-Civil War South. In 1883, William faced financial struggles, which forced him to sell all of his land and the mills on the steps of the courthouse. Williams' creditors devised a plan in which they would receive stock in the mills in lieu of the money they were owed, and the business would be operated by Thomas H. Battle, who was Joel Battle's great-grandson. William would live the rest of his life almost penniless and be forced to move in with his son. Starting in 1885, due to the additional expansion of numerous buildings, the mill construction of the mill village began. The village was very prosperous and would eventually contain 161 houses and its own school. Although there were no general stores in the village, the women would sell snacks and other goods from their back porches. Due to this, the co-workers and residents in the village became a very well-associated community. The rural areas of Edgecombe and Nash County had tobacco, while the mills in the village would be seen as a template for modern industry suburbia. The mill's business flourished to the end of the 1800s, and the new buildings continued to be added. The mill would be continued to be successful throughout the 20th century. During the early 1900s, the Rocky Mount Mills continued to serve the Tar River community as a cotton mill, which contained spinning spindles and twister spindles, used to spin fibers such as cotton into yarn. Technological advancements allowed the amount of spindles to increase by 10,000 in 1923. During this time period, the mills began to provide electricity to the mill and the surrounding community, supplying power to areas from Sunset Avenue to Highway 301. The nationwide Great Depression had a little effect on the mills. As a leader who had his employees' best interests in mind, Hyman Battle ensured the employees were provided with flour and sugar as needed, along with a three-day work week at the mills. Along with basic needs, the employees were provided with a live turkey each Christmas. In addition to technological advancements, the mills and village were extremely progressive with advancements such as increase in minimum wage to 32.5 cent per hour and a change in the 66 hour work week to a 60 hour work week. In 1939, Battle appeared at the hearing held by the Wage and Hour Administration to argue for the progression in salary rates. As the progressive manager and treasurer of the mills, Battle would lead the mills and its employees through the chaos of World War II. With the winds of the storm known as World War II blowing, the Rocky Mountain Mills increased production drastically and played a key role in the war effort. Before entering the war, the mill was producing clothing and yarn that was exchanged through the Lend-Lease Act to aid the future allies in their fight overseas. Throughout the war, the mill established itself as a contributor to the social, economic, and financial effects of the war. Socially, the mill provided a new form of communication, propaganda, and news through the Riverside Bulletin. The Riverside Bulletin updated the people with news of those who were wounded, killed, or missing in action. 
Along with, with contact through the bulletin, former employees who left to serve were able to keep up with the happenings of the mill and the village and were giving assurances that their jobs would be there upon their return. Soldiers serving away from home often wrote letters to Mr. Battle and the bulletin describing their time and expressing their regards to the mill employees at home, telling them to keep production rolling. Hello, Mr. Battle. I guess you're wondering who this is. Well, my name is Bill Ezel. I used to work at the mill. I wanted to tell you that I received quite a few of the Rocky Mountain Mills papers, and I sure do enjoy them. I also like the pinups. They sure are pretty. I have a sister working at the mill now, and I think she likes it fine. I haven't seen anyone I know yet. I sure would like to see someone I know. My brother is over here somewhere, but I don't know where. Sure would like to see him. Ask Sister Howell for me if she is going to marry that fellow you call Coley. Mr. Battle, how's everything around Rocky Mount? Fine, I hope. Sure would like to see the old place. Sure I'm glad the girls have got a good basketball team and tell them I said I hope they win every game. By the way, is Maggie Watkins still working at the mill? Well, Mr. Battle, I guess this is just about all the time I have. Tell all the people to keep the good work up and tell everyone I said hello. Please excuse this writing and thanks a lot for the paper. A friend, Bill Ezel, April 18, 1945, Luxembourg. Dear friends, just a few lines to say hello and let you know how much I appreciate your paper, the Riverside Bulletin. It's really a swell little paper and it gives just the news from home which all the boys like to hear most. I'm getting mine regular and it only takes 8 or 10 days for it to reach me. I'm always looking forward to my copy. The pinups are really good. There are still plenty of good looking ladies in good old Rocky Mount, or I should say at the mill. I see where some of the boys have returned for four lows and have received their discharges. I'm sure glad to see the boys start going home. Since my friend, Clarence Pears, has received his discharge, I guess he will start right here where he left off, working for you. He's really a swell guy. I hope to be with him in the near future. My division, the 80th, is supposed to return to the States in December, so I'm hoping to be on the four low at Christmas. If I do, it will be on my first time at home for Christmas in three years. We may hit the Japs since we are rated second best division over here in the ETO. So I'm closing and saying thanks a million for this well paper. A former employee, William Earl, August 3rd, 1945, Kempton, Germany. The mills had produced cloth, yarn, and clothing throughout every American war beginning in 1818, with 95% of the total production during World War II going toward the war effort. Materials produced with Rocky Mount Mills textiles during the war included, but were not limited to, aircraft engine covers, artillery covers, camo netting, cooking bags, gun slings, shelter tents, and magazine pockets. There was one death at the mills, Ambrose Paris, who was, whose accident precipitated safety and health procedures becoming a main priority of mill employees and managers. Paris was severely burned on March 30, 1943, when a switch in the number one spinning machine exploded, with him passing away on August 21, 1944, after being in the hospital for 16 months. Often written in the bulletin and other ads and newspapers were safety messages directing employees to take precaution and follow hazard prevention carefully in order to maintain a constant labor force. As 95% of the materials produced at the mills were used toward the war effort, the mill could not afford to lose employees due to inju injuries or neglect. Along with safety messages and letters from soldiers, the bulletin also used ad space for a majestic eagle that sat upon a shield with a star in the middle. The number in the star represented how many employees who were killed in action and the bottom number represented the total number of employees who served. As time progressed, the bottom number under the eagle and the shield increased. In total, the mill ended up losing seven employees to the war out of 172 employees who served. And the bulletin also, also dedicated a whole page to the ones who served and those who died. The mill's labor force was slowly declining as more men left to serve, forcing women to step up and take a vital role in the workforce. With men being away from their jobs, women at the mills stepped up to the plate and took over production. Much of the propaganda in the bulletin was directed toward women, advising them to increase their efforts and production for the war by all citizens. As said in the bulletin, the women were doing fine. Some of the jobs are mighty heavy for women, but all of them are doing their part and seem glad of the chance to help in the war effort. Men who served overseas often returned to the mills on their leave and when they were discharged. It was not a rare sight to see veterans and service members around the mill. Overall, the mill cared deeply about their employees and service members, which is evident through the constant attempts to honor those killed in action and maintain contact with those who were overseas. The Riverside Bulletin also included a colored page or passage that was written by Rufus Jones. 
Rufus gave insight of the mills from the African-American perspective at the time. He did this by providing a section called Colored News, in which he expressed his appreciation for the service of the black sacrifice and for their work being done on the home front. Often in these excerpts, Rufus thanked the blacks and remarked that he had hopes for peaceful coalition and welcoming arms between the races as they returned home. Prior to the order of the War Manpower Corporation, requiring a 48 hour per person work week for textile mills across the country, the Rocky Mount Mills, which was very progressive at the time, had already adopted this mandate. Also prior to this order, manager and owner Hyman L. Battle had installed higher wages and employee benefits like health insurance and mutual welfare. Propaganda for the war effort led to increased support for the war and even led to the mill employees raising $1,300 in 24 hours in support of Great Britain, with money going toward the funding for the service of an ambulance for one year. The war brought prosperity and success to the mills, and while most textile corporations sold off their housing villages, the Rocky Mount Mills remained under company control. At the conclusion of the war, the mills expanded its facilities and began to produce a variety of textile products rather than just cloth and yarn for the army. The prosperity of the mills during the war led to improvements around the mill. For example, the two-story porch built in 1910 of the Battle House was replaced along with many dwellings and porticles being restored. Houses and life at the mills changed slowly after the war, and the 1950s brought construction to houses as updates took place. After the war, pull factors such as better job opportunities and higher pay brought farmers to the mill. Seeking the benefits of a steady and secure income which was gained from working at the mills, other factors in which workers came included good housing which was provided in the form of a subdivision type area called the mill village, with new sidings and shingles and the benefits of electricity in the homes which would later contain an air conditioning unit these homes were ideal for the employees. The Mill Village was not only a suburban neighborhood, but the relationships among the residents were extremely close. The children who lived in the neighborhood went to the Rocky Mount Mill School together. Although the Mill residents viewed themselves as an elite, outsiders looking in saw them as lower class. Therefore, the students experienced discrimination when going to the schools, which were integrated with the Mill children in 1955. With the ongoing nationwide civil rights movement of the 1960s, African Americans seeking employment came to the mills. The mills began the move towards integration with the employment of the African American who previously worked as a custodian worker. As the walkout by white workers took place, however, it was unsuccessful as the progressive president Hyman Battle threatened to take away their jobs. Even though the mills were racially integrated, the separate but equal policy remained in effect, leading to the separate African-American bathrooms and water fountains. As time passed and Mossity subsided, many whites moved to jobs at other factories, and by the late 1990s, African-Americans would be the predominant workforce in the mills. In the late 1960s, Hyman Battle's son Thomas began operating the mills. As the Vietnam War took place, the need of cotton for the American troops was high as the war was the last era of high cotton demand in the mills, the production of textiles surged. Although the war was positively impacted the economy and production state of the mills, the 1990s brought other challenges for the mills. In 1991, John M. Mevin Jr., grandson of Thomas H. Battle, was elected president and chief executive of the mills. The installment of newer machines resulted in reduction of needed labor which led to a decrease in workers from 1,000 to 320 employees over the next few years. The production of yarn increased from 200,454 miles, which is 350,000 pounds of yarn per week with the use of these new technological advanced machines. The closing of Rocky Mount Mills came in 1996 and no one source could be considered the main culprit. A true perfect storm of foreign competitors with their low wage employees, the need for an even more efficient facility, the trickle down effect of the North American Free Trade Agreement, and the development of bulk barns for carrying of tobacco all led to a hard decision to close the business. Labor costs and longer working hours in foreign countries made it harder to sell product to customers. NAFTA didn't directly affect the mills, but it did affect the people they sold to. With many of those businesses closing shop and moving to Mexico, there were fewer operations to sell to. One of the lesser known reasons for a loss in revenue was the development of bookmarks to cure tobacco. 
These shiny new metal buildings replaced the old stick barns that dotted the Twin Counties. Twine was used to attach tobacco leaves to the sticks which were hung in the barns. The twine was sold directly to the farmers from Rocky Mount Mills as a retail product under the trademark brands of Riverside and Champion. As fewer farmers purchased the twine, the mills lost between $500,000 to $1 million in profits annually in twine alone under the last few years of operation. A hit to mill workers was that no government assistance was given to the employees who lost their jobs. NAFTA provided monies for workers of textile companies that moved to Mexico, but because Rocky Mountain Mills simply went out of business, there was no progress for them. Although the operation of the mills ceased, the building still stood. In 2010, committees in Rocky Mount started forming in an effort to allow the community to be a part of the revitalization and to experience the history of the 19th and 20th century mills and mill village. The plan began by renovating old housing and the tearing down of boarded houses. In the past years of 2016 and 2018, the Rocky Mount mills have undergone the intense process of gentrification, forming new restaurants and social areas under the ownership of Capital Broadcasting Company and is in the process of becoming a major attraction in the Rocky Mount area. The main building of the mills is planned to be transformed into various offices, restaurants, and apartment buildings. Other benefits to the community would include a community garden, event spaces, the rails to trails path, and an art maker space for residents. Along with the revamping of homes in the mill village, Battle Park, which was later donated to the city of Rocky Mount by Rocky Mount Mills in 1971 offers residents an outdoor space with a trail that falls behind some of the village homes and also around the dam which was previously used as the hydropower that provided electricity for the mills. Capital Broadcasting anticipates tenants occupying the mills by the end of 2018. Rocky Mount Mills was the center of activity for the area when it was first conceived and even though its appearance and purpose has changed over nearly 200 years, it is once again becoming the place to be in Rocky Mount. The mill's influence on the social and economic aspects of East North Carolina and the twin counties of Nash and Edgecombe will always hold a special place in the memories of the local inhabitants. Whatever happened to predictability? The milkman, the paper boy. TV. Did I get delivered here? Somebody tell me, please. This old world.